Given how often this channel features Commodore content, it's kind of a surprise we haven't talked about the Mr. FPGA's C64 core yet. Let's fix that right now in episode 75 of Retro Bits. Here we are in the Mr.'s main menu. To use the Commodore 64 core, there's nothing you need to install or configure. Just run your update script and you'll be ready to go. The core is based on the existing FPGA 64 project by Peter Wendrich and has been extensively modified by many contributors over the last six years. It supports the most popular features you'd want, including floppy and tape images, cartridges, dual SIDs, and RAM expansions. One neat trick we'll look at is the ability to attach physical hardware, like drives and printers. While the core's feature set is relatively small when compared to the popular Vice emulator, it's important to remember that the latter has been under constant development for nearly 30 years now. So let's take a look at some of the more interesting capabilities and put the core through its paces. First, let's look at the video options. Here's my homemade SCART cable for the Mister. RGB output isn't something a real C64 can do. Well, that's not entirely true. There is an FPGA-based hardware add-on you can install. Anyway, RGB is the preferred way of using a CRT with the Mister, and it looks absolutely fantastic on a real Commodore monitor. Check out how crisp that is. I know it's trite to say, but the camera doesn't do it justice. Of course, you also have the option of using a more modern display with the Mister's scaled VGA, DVI, or HDMI output. With the recent addition of new video processing capabilities, you can apply all kinds of filters to customize the output to your liking. Let's start by taking a look at some of the default presets. First, we've got some basic scanline options like the ones you'd find in just about every modern emulator. I like the way they look, especially since this Dell panel has the correct aspect ratio and resolution for integer scaling of the 240p source. Some of these other presets, like second gen console here, are actually pretty convincing. There are even presets for specific model lines like the Sony PVM. The details on how these new video filters work probably deserve an entire episode on their own. Check out this composite CRT filter. Let me do an AB comparison here. Yeah, that's pretty neat. And here's an LCD filter on my LCD panel. Cool. There are even shadow mask filters, and one designed specifically to look like the Commodore 1084. It's pretty fun to mess around with all the settings, but you have to be careful because there are plenty of bad combinations as well. Hey, at least I was able to get jail bars, so that's authentic. By default, the core comes complete with the standard C64 kernel and drive ROMs. It also includes Dolphin DOS, which was enabled by default on my installation. I've changed it back to standard for now, but if we select Loadable C64, it will activate whichever custom ROM we have installed. Let's mount up a D64 disk image and do some performance testing with the original machine first and then with Dolphin DOS. The latter is a disk speed enhancement consisting of a replacement kernel and drive ROM along with a RAM buffer and a user port parallel drive interface. Together, these upgrades can see disk speeds up to 20 times faster than the factory performance that we're benchmarking now. Now, let's perform the same test with Dolphin DOS enabled. Hitting Commodore Run Stop loads the first program on disk. Wow, that's face meltingly fast. I never encountered this back in the day, and I'm not sure how compatible it is with all software, but you can't deny that speed. Finally, let's try using our own custom ROMs. For that, we'll need to drop to a shell with F9. Now, if you've seen our episode on Jiffy DOS, you'll know I'm a huge fan. If not, maybe check that out next. To create our own custom ROM, we'll need to concatenate three things together. Basic, kernel, and a disk drive ROM. 
For Jeffy DOS, we'll need to use the 1541-2 image as demonstrated here, as the original 1541 image is the wrong size. The resulting combined file must be exactly 32,768 or 49,152 bytes long. Although it's easily obtainable, Jiffy DOS is not free, and I did purchase a license to use these ROMs with emulation. Please support retro businesses since they support us. A link is in the description. To use our new ROM, open the core menu and navigate to Hardware, and then to the System ROM option. From here, we can specify the file we just created. Let's see how Jiffy DOS compares to Dolphin's parallel drive interface. Not bad, it's still five times faster than factory. Next, let's take a look at cartridge support. The GitHub page states that the core has support for almost all cartridge formats. In addition, the core also supports the C64 game system, so let's enable that kernel ROM and try it out with a traditional 16K cartridge. Okay, that worked fine. Now, let's try out an Ocean Type A cart that supports up to 256K with bank switching. No problems there. Next, let's try a Gmod 2 cart. This is a newer format that supports up to half a megabyte of ROM along with a small 2K EEPROM for save data. Well, that didn't work. I guess that's what they meant by almost all. Last, let's try out the one megabyte Easy Flash format that is super popular these days. Next up, Turbo Mode. The core features two options to accelerate your C64. The first is 128 mode, utilized by a handful of titles that require the extra oomph of a 2 MHz processor. The other is Smart Mode in 2x, 3x, or 4x multiples. Smart because the acceleration automatically disables when disk access occurs for compatibility. Let's take a look at a game that makes use of the 128 mode first. Titles such as this attempt to detect when they're being run on a Commodore 128 in 64 mode. In such cases, the CPU is switched into 2 MHz mode only when the raster line is in the upper and lower borders, as the VIC-2 display chip cannot operate at these faster speeds. This can yield a performance increase of 30% over a stock C64. Here, the game has detected the core masquerading as a 128, and will utilize the faster CPU as just described. On an NTSC machine at 60Hz, this game experiences slowdown when there are multiple enemies on the screen at the same time. With C128 Turbo Mode enabled, the slowdown that would happen in this area is eliminated and the game plays totally smoothly. 
I tried enabling Smart Turbo to see what it would do, but it crashes this game instantly when either loading or playing. Let's see if Smart Turbo makes for a better basic experience. Let me start with the tried and true one line maze generator. Here, it's running at the original clock speed. When I enable C128 mode, nothing happens. That's expected because software needs to be aware and actively make use of the faster CPU. How about Smart Mode 2X now? 3X? 4X? Yeah, that's quite a significant performance boost. I can see it being useful here. Though I did notice that Smart Turbo seems to have an effect on keyboard polling, resulting in the occasional dropped keystroke. Let's look at another game that benefits from acceleration. Sonic the Hedgehog comes on a D81 image, which the course supports just fine. The game also requires a RAM expansion, and we have several options here, including both GeoRAM and REUs up to 16 megabytes, which are useful for some demos and Nuvi videos. But 512K will be fine for our immediate needs. Like Super Mario, the game will detect and use C128 Turbo Mode just fine, but I have it disabled right now. Also just like Mario, on an unaccelerated NTSC machine, Sonic lags quite a bit when there are lots of things on the screen at once. Pay attention to the tearing that occurs, especially when the screen scrolls vertically during jumping. This spot in particular shows off the lag pretty well. Let me turn on Smart Turbo now and see what happens. Much better. I don't know how well this comes through in a 30 frame per second video capture or after YouTube converts it, but believe me, in person it's so much smoother with 2x Turbo. The 3X and 4X Turbo don't seem to yield any measurable improvements in gameplay, but they do cause some graphical corruption, so I'm going to stick with 2X in this game. One other neat thing about the core is you can change between PAL and NTSC at any time. This is especially handy for demos that won't run properly on NTSC hardware or SID files that play too fast. In the case of Sonic though, sorry PAL, I just can't. While we're talking about SIDs, let's turn our attention to the core's audio implementation. The sound interface device is based on the Redip SID project, an FPGA-based SID replacement for real Commodore machines. Both 6581 and 8580 variants of the hardware are implemented, and two chips are provided for stereo sound. Dozens of custom filters can be downloaded from the net should you want to customize your mister even further. By default, the second SID chip simply mirrors the first. This only yields the normal three voices, but it will come from both left and right speakers. Changing the base address allows you to use software that supports two or more chips. Many stereo.sid files use D420, so we'll go with that. Here in SIDPlay64, we're prompted to enter the address of our second chip, but I don't think it really matters what we put here. .sid files are coded to use specific hardware addresses, and the player can't translate on the fly, like the Compute Music System Stereo Player. By the way, if you haven't seen our episode on the history of stereo SIDs, go ahead and cue that up too.
In addition to the stereo SIDS, the core implements a few other hardware devices. The first is the sound expander. This device was originally released in 1985 at a cost of 125 US dollars. It added FM synthesis capabilities using the same Yamaha OPL chip that could be found in over 30 arcade games of the time. The sound expander could be upgraded to use the OPL2 chip found in AdLib and Sound Blaster cards, and that's what the Mr. Core has implemented for us. The Sound Expander originally shipped with its own music tool, but no other commercial games or applications supported the device, so it remained fairly obscure. More recently, there are a handful of homebrew titles and music demos that use the hardware, so it's neat to see this capability included on the Mister. The final sound device that's supported is the Digimax, a user port add-on from the early 2000s that provides 8-bit digital-to-analog conversion in four stereo channels. There are a few trackers available for the Digimax, and it can even be used to play Amiga mod files, but that particular software requires a super CPU, which is not implemented in the C64 core. Yet. All right, you've made it this far, so let's get to the real reason you're here, the SNAC to IEC. This project implements a hardware interface for connecting real Commodore disk drives and other IEC devices to the IO board serial port. The GitHub page has both breakout and surface mount variants that you can build with only a handful of components. So let's do just that. First, we'll need some PCBs created from the supplied Gerber files. I ordered 10 copies from a popular Chinese manufacturer for a total price of just under $14 shipped. I was able to source all the required parts for the breakout version of the board on another popular Chinese website. Total price, $11 shipped. All told, the per unit cost of each completed snack to IEC should come out to just under $5 a piece. All right, let's build the Snack 2 IEC adapter. All the parts are here, starting with our PCBs. Everything else that I ordered from China did not arrive in time. In fact, I failed to notice that the parts wouldn't arrive until the end of January or early February, so everything here is either from DigiKey or Amazon, and I'll get the rest of the parts later. But the PCBs arrived fairly quickly, within a week or so, and they are smaller than I thought they would be, but of course, there's not much to it, so we'll take a look at the components that go on the PCB and see what we've got. First up, we have the six pin DIN connector. This is going to allow us to connect the Commodore IEC devices, printers, and disk drives to the MISTER. So we've got the six pin DIN. Next thing we've got is a USB 3.0 male 90 degree adapter, and this is a surface mount adapter. Take a look at those tiny little pins. I've never soldered anything this small before, so this will be a bit of a challenge. Um, this is a USB 3.0 uh, connector, but the serial native accessory converter or snack port is actually just a serial connection on the mister. It's not really USB 3. Next up, we have a level shifter, and this will convert the five volts of the Commodore IEC bus to the 3.3 volts needed by the SNAC interface. 
In addition to the level shifter, we have a 3.3 volt power regulator. This is just a little voltage regulator on a board that attaches. Nothing to that. And then optionally, we have two other components. One is this barrel connector, and this will allow us to add uh, and power a SD2 IEC or a Raspberry Pi running Pi 1541 software if we want to connect that directly to the mister. And if we use that barrel connector, we should also solder in some surface mount capacitors. Take a look at how small those are. My goodness, I don't know if I'm going to be able to add those with my current level of soldering skill or not. So we may omit the power jack from the build, depending on if I can solder these in or not. All right, so there are all the parts. Let's get this build started. All right, so I've got my board ready to solder and I'm gonna start with the small surface mount parts first and see if I can do those. Starting with the uh, tiny capacitor. So I've got it here in my tweezers. And what I'm gonna try and do is just use a very fine tip uh, on my soldering iron and just drop a blob of solder from the tip directly onto this and hope that that will go. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna lay down some flux here on the pads Hopefully that will help with the uh, solder getting where it needs to go. There we go. Let's see if we can do this. Hold it in place and drop a blob of solder onto the pad. All right, that was too much solder. It's definitely on there, but I'm gonna have to clean that up. That's a little messy. Let me do the same thing on the other side. Okay, that one's a little bit cleaner. Let me see if I can clean up that other side. All right, it's not pretty, but it's on there. <laughs> uh, that's a learning experience. Let's move on. All right, so next up I wanna do the USB port and it's held in place by these two posts and then we've got these eight conductors to connect. Um, very small and I'm probably going to bridge them all. So there's two options. One is to try the uh, flux and dab method and the other is to pre-tin the pads and then use the uh, heat gun to try and melt them all into place at once. So I'm going to try the dab method again. I'll try and be a little bit more careful this time and we'll see where, where we go with that. Generous amount of flux. What I'm going to do is I'm going to secure the posts first. This is kind of fiddly. <laughs> I'm just going to try and melt some solder here to get it to hold in place. And there's one. You know, if it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. Okay, all the pads look aligned properly. Let me zoom you in on that a little bit. All right, let's see if I can do this. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this or not. Smallest amount of solder, dab the pad. Hmm, maybe. Certainly going. It's running in there. I got a bridge. Let me clean up that bridge. I may have mentioned this before, but it's incredibly difficult to work on something like this when it's far away from you physically on the camera, it has to be for the camera to pick it up. And so I am working very far outside of my range of vision and where my arms can reach, so it's really difficult. 
All right, I cleaned them up a bit with some desoldering wick and the uh, tip of the soldering iron, and I think it's pretty good now. It's uh, it's not beautiful, but it's it, I think it'll be fine, and I'm gonna test it with my multimeter and make sure there aren't any bridge connections. So I'll do that, and then we'll do the rest of the through-hole stuff, which should be really easy. And while I was cleaning it up, I also cleaned up the capacitor a little bit. So it's not great, but it's better than it was. All right, next I'm gonna install the level shifter and it kind of just sits on these pin headers here. So we'll get them installed on the board and then we match up the LV1 mark to LV1 on the level shifter itself. Get it situated like that. I'm gonna solder up the top first and then I'll do the bottom side afterward. All right, so the next thing I wanna do is install the voltage regulator. Now it has these 90 degree pins on it. I could desolder them and install flat pins because it needs to sit flush like this. Um, but what I'm gonna try and do is just install it and then bend the pins. So once again, V in, match to V in on the little PCB here. And if I take that and I give it I think that'll do. Let me get that soldered in. Just uh, bridging everything today, it looks like. Okay, run into a problem here. The IEC connector, the six pin DIN, it has the correct number of legs that match up to the PCB here, but if you'll notice, these supports um, don't match up to the, the holes in the PCB. So I'm gonna need to order a different part here. I assume that this is for the outer grounding shell. So what I can do is I can create a bodge wire that goes from this metal faceplate down and around the bottom to uh, connect to one of these pins. And I'll have to replace this part later. But since I don't have a suitable replacement now, I'm going to bodge it and then we will um, at least be able to test it. So I'll get this in. So yeah, I checked and there is a ground port, uh, ground pin on the six pin connector. So I think these are just for support, um, you know, to, to give it stability when you plug and unplug things. So I'm going to replace this connector with a suitable one later on, but we'll at least have something we can test now. And I'll just have to be careful when I insert and remove uh, cables. And last but not least, we've got the barrel connector for the auxiliary power here. All right, and there we go. One snack, two IEC, fully built, uh, more or less. It isn't pretty, but um, this is a little bit beyond my level of skill right now. But you know, practice, practice makes perfect. So I'll build 10 more of these and by the 10th one, it'll probably be pretty good. The important question is, will it work? Only one way to find out. To enable support for the Snack to IEC, navigate to the hardware section of the core menu and locate the external IEC setting. When I reset the core, the drive light flashed momentarily. That's normal for real hardware, so it's a good sign. I've got a disc here, so let's see what happens. Ha! Would you look at that! On the first attempt even! Amazing! So, why would anyone want to use a real drive with the Mister in the first place? Well, maybe you have some original software you want to use, or perhaps an old data disc you'd like to archive. Mostly though, because it's fun and because we can. 
The core allows you to mix both real and virtual drives. Here, I'll mount a blank disk image on Virtual Drive 9 so I can make a backup of a real disk to an image on the Mister's SD card. Of course, the opposite works as well, and you can create real disks from images you downloaded from the internet, for example. And after a small eternity, the copy finished successfully and my newly created image is ready to go. While the SNAC2 IEC interface should work with any type of real hardware, including printers, even hard drives, one thing it cannot do is support multiple real drives simultaneously. Some users have reported success when using a Pi 1541 or SD2 IEC, but only a single physical drive is supported by the current hardware design at this time. In my testing, turning on a second device with a unique ID just caused the bus to become unresponsive. A Commodore 128 core for the Mister is also in the works, and a public beta is available outside the normal update channels. Like the C64 core, it also has support for external IEC devices, although it's not yet in a state where complex software like GEOS or demo scene productions work properly. One last capability of the core I wanted to demonstrate before we wrap up is the built-in modem support. From the hardware menu, we need to change what's in the user port from the default joystick adapter to an RS-232 serial interface. Next, we can select either the VIC-1011 modem or the high-speed UP9600 option. Head back to the main menu and then hit the right arrow to get to the system menu. Set the UART mode to modem and select the appropriate baud rate. The core can DMA load single file programs instantly, as demonstrated here with CCGMS term. With the terminal settings configured to match our core configuration, we can now dial out and access any number of online services, both old and new. So there we have it, the C64 core for the Mr. FPGA and the SNAC2 IEC adapter for connecting real Commodore hardware. I think enthusiasts will find that what's available right now covers the most common use cases and things just keep getting better and better with the system. For me, the dual SIDs, turbo modes, and crisp RGB video only help to seal the deal. I hope you enjoyed this bit, thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.